today. It's received no a- attention in the Western media, but something actually rather remarkable happened on November 26 in Washington, D.C., in connection with the o- ongoing development of international affairs. This is that the Chinese and Russian ambassadors, um, Xin Gang and Anatoly Anatol- Antonov, published together a joint statement. Now, to my knowledge, this is the first time that the Russian and Chinese ambassadors have published a joint statement in this way, and this particular joint statement sets out a joint position by China and Russia on the forthcoming democracy summit that um, the Biden administration is about to convene. Once more, we see the Russians and the Chinese acting in effect as allies, coordinating their positions, setting out their policies, in effect supporting each other and making it very clear that they are presenting a united front against the United States and its allies. Now, the statement itself is relatively short. It's been published in National Interest. It was addressed to National Interest and it was published there. National Interest is one of that endless number of American news sites and magazines which set out the thoughts and ideas of the think tank community about the foreign policy of the United States. National Interest sometimes attempts to take a more realist position, but you will also find plenty of neocon writers writing there also. Anyway, this is what the Russian and Chinese ambassadors said in that statement, in that statement which is written, as I said, in national interest, in the full knowledge that it will be picked up and widely read by the US's foreign policy community. This is what they wrote. The United States will be hosting the online summit for democracy on December 9th to 10th, empowering itself to define who is to attend the event and who is not, and who is a democratic country and who is not eligible for such status. An evident product of its Cold War mentality, this will stoke up ideological confrontation and a rift in the world, creating new dividing lines. This trend contradicts the development of the modern world. It is impossible to prevent the shaping of a global polycentric architecture, but could strain the objective process. China and Russia firmly reject this move. Peace, development, fairness, justice, democracy and freedom are common values of humanity. Democracy is not a prerogative of a certain country or a group of countries, but a universal right of all peoples. It can be realised in multiple ways and no model can fit all countries. Whether a country's path works depends on whether it meets the country's realities, follows the trend of the times and brings about economic development, social stability and progress and better lives for the people. Ultimately, it relies on the support of the people and will be proven by its contribution to human progress. Therefore, a basic criterion of democracy should be about the people, i.e. whether the people have the right to govern their country, whether their needs are met and whether they have a sense of fulfilment and happiness. If the people are only awakened when casting their votes and sent back to hibernation when the voting is over, if they are served with sweet-sounding slogans in campaigns but have no say after the election, if they are wooed during canvassing but left out in the cold after that, this is not a genuine democracy. What China has is an extensive, whole-process socialist democracy. It reflects the people's will, suits the country's realities, and enjoys strong support from the people. 
In China, the people have the right to elections and they can get deeply involved in national governance, exercising their power through the People's Congresses at the national and other levels. China has eight non-communist parties participating in governance, as well as a unique system and corresponding institutions of political consultation. On matters concerning people's keen interests, there are broad-based and sufficient consultations and discussions before any decision is made. Policies and measures can only be produced, introduced when there is a consensus that they are what the people want and will serve the people's needs. It has been proved that the whole process democracy works in China and works very well. China calls for building a community with a shared future for mankind. As residents of the same global village, we, shall ha we should handle international affairs through consultation. Russia is a democratic, federative, law-governed state with a republican form of government. Democracy is the fundamental principle of its political system. The de democratic institutions were further strengthened by the amendments to the constitution adopted through a referendum in 2020. In Russia, the development of democracy is closely connected to culture and traditions. Traditions of its parliamentarianism go back over a hundred years. Russia's political system is evolving steadily and needs a stable and calm environment that guarantees the rights and interests of its people. Democracy is not just about domestic governance. It should also be reflected in international relations. A truly democratic government will support democracy in international relations. It will not foster hegemony and division abroad while building democracy and unity at home. The path to prosperity of nations goes through respectful cooperation with each other, despite some differences in views on particular issues. The sovereignty, security and development interests of a country should not be violated. Interfering in other countries' internal affairs under the pretext of fighting corruption, promoting democratic values or protecting human rights, hindering their development, wielding the big stick of sanctions and even infringing on their sovereignty, unity and territorial integrity, go against the United Nations Charter and other basic norms of international law and are obviously anti-democratic. No country has the right to judge the world's vast and varied political landscape by a single yardstick and having other countries copy one's political system through colour revolution, regime change and even use of force which goes against international law, all being obviously anti-democratic. International affairs should be handled in accordance with the principles of extensive consultation, joint contribution and shared benefits, and decide, decided in the spirit of true multilateralism. There should be a more inclusive go global governance, not something like, like might makes right. Seeking supremacy and putting oneself always first are acts of hegemonism and unilateralism and are obviously anti-democratic. Common security and development are a prevailing aspiration of the international community. Using ideology to bring down other countries and promote a geostrategy for absolute security will lead to division and confrontation and are obviously anti-democratic. There is only one international system in the world, i.e. the international system with the United Nations at its core. There is only one international order, i.e. the one in underpinned by international law. And there is only one set of rules, i.e., the basic norms governing international relations based on the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter. Flaunting the rules-based international order without referencing the United Nations and international law 
and attempting to replace international rules with the dictums of certain blocs falls into the category of revisionism and is obviously anti-democratic. There has, there has seen no shortage of wars and turmoil worldwide to prove that spreading democracy, its political system and values against other countries will severely undermine regional and international peace, security and stability. Bombings of Yugoslavia, military intervention in Iraq, Afghanistan and Libya and democratic transformation do nothing but harm. Countries should focus on running their own affairs well, not condescendingly criticising others. There is no need to worry about democracy in Russia and China. Certain foreign governments better think about themselves and what is going on in their own homes. Is it freedom when various rallies in their countries are dispersed with rubber bullets and tear gas? It does not look very much like freedom. Faced with an array of global challenges, countries urgently need to strengthen coordination and cooperation for common progress, especially today when the international community needs to improve cooperation between all countries to counter the pandemic, foster economic development and neutralise cross-border threats. China and Russia call on all countries Stop using value-based diplomacy to provoke division and confrontation. Practice mutual respect and win-win cooperation in international relations and work for harmonious coexistence between countries with different social systems, ideologies, histories and development levels. So that is a joint statement by the Russian and Chinese ambassadors. And it tracks very closely many of the things that Xi Jinping said to President Biden over the course of their virtual summit um, 10 days ago, um, and which was reported at such inordinate length in the readout of that summit published by the Chinese Foreign Ministry, which I discussed in my own inordinately long video of a few days ago. Now, before I proceed, I think there's a few things I want to say of a general nature about um, this statement. Firstly, obviously, as I said, it shows that the Ru Russia and China are more than just friends. When they talk about themselves being partner countries, we have to accept the reality that they are to all intents and purposes, allies. They're working all the time, agreeing international positions, agreeing military strategies. I'm going to do a programme about this shortly, um, discussing what each other's red lines are with respect to the United States and agreeing to support each other's red lines. Um, so this is, as I've said many times, a de facto alliance in all but name, and in fact the Chinese and the Russians are talking about it being something better and superior than an alliance, in effect implicitly admitting that it is an alliance. But there is something else, and it comes out very clearly and very obviously, both from this joint statement and from that long commentary, that long lecture, if you like, that Xi Jinping handed down to uh, Joe Biden at that summit meeting 10 days ago. It's, you often hear it said, you often hear people claim that in contrast to the situation during the Cold War, there is no actual ideological division, that all sides, both of the sides to the present international conflict, um, essentially agree with each other on fundamentals. This is no longer a conflict between capitalism and communism and, you know, the free world and the communist world in the way, in the way that it was during the Cold War. It's purely now a question of power and of geopolitics. I think that this is becoming increasingly less true 
because what we're starting to see is a clear philosophical difference between the two power blocks and, dare I say, an increasing ideological difference. And it's an ideological difference which has been driven by the United States and by its allies. The United States self-defines as a democracy. It claims to be leading the democratic world. It sees its mission as expanding its conception of democracy all over the world, to every part of the world. And it's come to believe that expanding democracy in that way is essential as an absolute guarantee for its own security. And this has become increasingly linked to all sorts of interesting ideas. The idea that because the United States is in this position where it expands democracy around the world, that it has a right based on values and human rights law to create its own rules-based international order, one which where it sets the rules and where it sets the limits of what it does, and something which is conceptually distinct, as I've discussed some months ago in another video, something that is conceptually distinct from international law as commonly understood and which is anchored in the United Nations. And the rationale and the justification for this is that um, within the body of international law, there is international human rights law. International human rights law somehow empowers the United States as the country which embodies democratic values to meddle and interfere in the affairs of all other countries and doing so is supposedly necessary. It's part of its value system. And that has become very much an article of faith for many US decision makers and, by the way, for the decision makers in some Western countries, the Britain, the British political class has wholesale adopted this philosophy and in Germany you see the Green Party is adopting it also. And of course all of this gets linked up in the Western mind with the issue of globalisation. The idea that there needs to be free movement of capital to every part of the world, that countries cannot, in effect, run their own economic policies as they see fit, because doing so somehow breaks up the globalised system of the international economy, and that this system, this system of divergence in terms of economic models, it needs to be broken down, and that this ability to move capital around the world is somehow to be conflated with the expansion of democracy to every part of the world so that the a, a democratic world, a democratic world order is one which includes all of humanity. The system of democracy is the one that is decided upon it by the United States and by the Western powers. And as part of that democratic system, there is to be a single form of economic um, um, activity, modelling, which is to be based upon the uncontrolled, unregulated free movement of capital in a way which will obviously ultimately benefit the United States and the US elites there. So this is very much an American conception. And it's a conception, as I said, which has been accepted by some of the US's allies. What we are now starting to see is that the Russians and the Chinese are now increasingly challenging this at an intellectual level. They're starting to say that they don't just oppose this, but they oppose it for philosophical, if you like, 
grounds or intellectual grounds. What they're saying, first of all, is that whatever it is that the United States calls itself, it is not in a position to say which country is a democracy and which is not. That that is a fundamentally anti-democratic viewpoint. It sets one country, the United States, as the arbiter of what democracy is, whereas democracy is something that is to be decided in each country by the people who live in that country. So if people in one country decide that they're going to develop a particular model which suits them and which they're happy with and which they support, but which might not operate in exactly the kind of way that the United States does, that doesn't mean that that country is not a democracy, or at least is not a country which is evolving into a democracy. It simply means that that country is doing things in its own way, that it is in fact choosing its own path, which it has a right to do. And democracy is not therefore the private property of the United States. The United States does not have copyright or title over the concept. It is one which every country in the world is in a position to define as best suits it. That's a pretty radical view. It is one which I'm fairly sure would be overwhelmingly rejected, not just in the United States, but in the West in general. The idea that countries around the world can develop their own political systems, and provided those systems are generally supported by the people of those countries, that qualifies them, if not as democracies, as countries that are moving or as aspiring to democracies. Well, that's something, as I said, which London and Washington and Paris and Brussels and Berlin will, will find impossible to accept, uh, uh, and they will oppose it vehemently. Elsewhere in the world, however, people might see this in a very different way. They might say to themselves, well, actually, this Chinese-Russian perspective of democracy, that democracy is what is supported by the people and what works in a particular country, well, that might be more attractive to us, that might be more uh, beneficial to us than that which the United States is proposing and is trying to force upon us, which is its idea of what democracy is. And then the Chinese and the Russians, and here one has to say one senses that it's more the Chinese who come up with these ideas than the Russians, um, make certain rather telling observations about the nature of democracy in the United States itself. And they are coming very close to questioning whether the United States is, in fact, any sort of democracy at all. And, of course, democracy is a political concept that flows from a Greek word, demos is the people, kratos is the state or the power in the state. So a democracy is a state in which the people have power. And this statement challenges whether that really is the situation in the United States. Now, it's very careful not to identify the United States at this point, but of which other country can one say uh, these words? Of which other country is it likely that the writers of this statement, the Russian and Chinese ambassadors, are thinking than of the United States when they say people's, people like this? If people are only awakened when casting their votes and sent back to hibernation when the voting is over, if they are served with sweet-sounding slogans in campaigns, but have no say after the election, if they are wooed during canvassing, but left in the cold after that, this is not a genuine democracy. 
Now, there are, of course, some people, quite a lot of people, actually, in the United States who would take, who would agree with that. They would say that this does actually describe increasingly the situation in the United States, and not just in the United States, but in many Western countries. You get the political class, it holds elections, there are all sorts of claims and positions and poses struck during those elections. People come out and vote, and then after the elections are over, things continue in exactly the same way as they did before. And perhaps if one follows the ancient Greek conception of democracy, well, that might not be quite the genuine democracy that the Western powers claim that it is. Certainly, the Chinese and the Russians in this joint statement are in effect saying that it is not. Well, again, one can come up with all sorts of contrary arguments. People in the United States and in the West will say, well, it may be that elections are not in themselves sufficient to have for a functioning democracy, but that without elections, what you have cannot be considered a democracy at all. That, of course, is the counter-argument. But it is interesting to see that this argument is now being made. In other words, the Chinese and the Russians are challenging the United States, not just over its right to dictate democracy, or what it calls democracy, to all other countries. They are intellectually challenging the United States. They are saying that the United States may not be, in fact, the perfect democracy, or indeed a genuine democracy at all, as it claims. And then, of course, the Chinese and the Russians talk about their own political systems. The Chinese are much more uh, self-confident about theirs. They talk about how their system, which they call a whole process democracy, something which I'm sure many people in the United States would take issue with. But anyway, that's what the Chinese say, that their, Chinese, uh, that their whole process democracy is popular and widely supported and that it produces optimal outcomes for China. Note, by the way, how much more modest the Russians are in describing their own political system. Unlike the Chinese, the Russians accept that their political system is a work in progress. There is this very interesting sentence, Russia's political system is evolving steadily and needs a stable and calm environment that guarantees the rights and interests of its people. So the fact that it is evolving steadily means that it is not a done thing, that it is moving towards a democratic future, but that it has not yet achieved it in its entirety. The Russians, as I said, are notably more modest about their political system than the Chinese are. Then we come to the next point, which is perhaps even the most interesting, which is that the Chinese and the Russians also say, you cannot be a democracy, you cannot call yourself a democracy, even if you try and run things democratically at home, if you do not run international relations in a democratic way. And here, their conception, again, is profoundly different from that of the United States. Because as far as the United States is concerned, running international relations in a democratic way means expanding democracy. That is what the goal of the United States is. That's its values, supposedly. It must expand democracy. It must use every lever, every tool, human rights law, colour change, regime change, all those things in order to expand democracy because that is the purpose and mission of the United States. And democracy and the United States itself cannot be secure until that 
objective is achieved and the entire world is become a democracy. That's the US idea of running foreign policy in a democratic way. And the Chinese and the Russians say, hold on, that's not democratic at all. That is anti-democracy. Democracy is about accepting that there is an international community and accepting that every part of that community has a right to its own voice and respecting that voice and not trying to trample over other countries and impose one's ideas upon them. No country has the right to judge the world's vast and varied political landscape by a single country, yardstick, and having other countries copy one's political system through colour re color revolution, regime change, and even use of force against international law. Doing so is obviously anti-democratic. It's as if the Russians and the Chinese see the world as consisting of a group of states which form, if you like, the electorate of humanity. Each one of those states has its rights and its right to vote in what you might call the general election of humanity. And each one of those votes has, if not perhaps exactly equal value, at least its own value. That, from the Russian-Chinese point of view, is democracy in the international system. And the Russians and the Chinese go on to say that this global democracy, as they define it, this, if you like, electorate of nations, it is, of course, underpinned by international law, by the United Nations Charter. They make it absolutely clear that international law is the entire basis upon which this whole system of global democracy actually functions, and they fundamentally reject the idea that there can be a rules-based international order, divorced or separated from international law, with the rules decided upon by the United States and its friends. And again, the position here could not be more clear. There is only one system, international system in the world, the international system with the United Nations at its core. There is only one international order, the one underpinned by international law. There is only one set of rules, the basic norms governing international relations based on the purpose and principles of the United Nations Charter. Flaunting the rules-based international order without referencing the United Nations and international law and attempting to replace international rules with the dictum of certain blocks falls into the category of revisionism and is obviously anti-democratic. Now, the concept about revisionism is extremely interesting because, of course, the United States is incessantly claiming that the Russians and the Chinese are revisionist states. It claims that the Russians and the Chinese want to up, upturn the international system. They want to change the international system in order to suit themselves. They are, in effect, rogue actors. The Chinese and the Russians say, on the contrary, the diametric opposite is the truth. We are the conservatives. We are the people who seek to defend international law and the international system. It is the United States with its pernicious idea of the rules-based international order, which it is seeking to impose upon the world, which is the true revisionist, which is the actual country, which is behaving like a rogue actor, which is disrupting the international system. So, and that, of course, the Chinese and the Russians provide us with that long catalogue of American in, um, interventions around the world, which they cite as proof of that view that it is the United States 
that is the true revisionist, the true rogue actor in the international system. Bombings of Yugoslavia, military intervention in Iraq, Afghanistan and, Li and Libya, and democratic transformation, those words democratic transformation in quotation marks, which do nothing but harm. Countries should focus on running their own affairs well, not condescendingly criticising others. And so what they're saying is this system of the United States trying to impose its ideas upon the world, that is revisionism, that is aggression, that is anti-democratic, and of course the United States anyway isn't the democracy it claims to be, and democracy is something anyway that each country must discover and develop on its own as suits its own traditions and its own interests and its own socioeconomic path and situation. Now, as I said, that is a major philosophical change. It's, if you like, a conservative response to a extremely um, forceful attempt by the United States to reshape the international system, the, the whole global system, in a way that suits itself. And the Russians and the Chinese, moreover, predict that it will fail that the attempt to reorder international situation in that kind of way is impossible. The, this trend contradicts the development of the modern world. It is impossible to prevent the shaping of a global polycentric architecture, but could strain the objective process. In other words, what the United States is trying to do cannot succeed, but in the process, the US attempt to make it succeed is creating international tension, global conflict and war, and is disrupting the smooth operation of the international system. Well, it seems to me, as I said, that this is a clear philosophical divide. If you like, it's a divide between American neoliberalism or neoconservatism. To my mind, they're one and the same thing with its globalist um, ideas tacked on against a profoundly conservative view of the international system expressed by China and Russia. One where each country finds its own path, where each country finds its own path towards democracy and defines democracy in a way that suits its own nation and culture and traditions, and one where the Chinese and the Russians insist upon every right, the right of every country to its own voice, as opposed to the American idea where all countries must in effect speak one voice which happens to be saying essentially the same things as what the United States is saying. Well, it goes without saying that there is an enormous amount of self-serving language in this joint statement. I and mean, when the Russians and the Chinese, especially when the Chinese, insist that their country is a democracy, as I said, I'm sure that there are many people in the United States who would take very strong issue and who would refute that. Many people in the United States, of course, would say the same about Russia also. But it is also the case that this is a division, this is a difference in international relations, which I suspect is going to be increasingly appealing to more and more countries. More and more countries around the world are going to say to themselves, well, who do I go along with? Do I go along with the Americans who tell me what I should think, how I should run my affairs, what sort of policies I should follow, who have an ideological perspective of the world 
and who expect me always to fall into line behind them on any particular global issue? Or do I go along with the Chinese and the Russians, who are, shall we say, intensely relaxed about whatever happens in my own country, don't see it as their job to meddle in the internal affairs of my country, and who tell me that I have as much right to express my views on any international issue as anyone else. Well, I get the sense that quite a lot of countries, including, dare I say, most of the countries that are going to attend this virtual summit meeting, I'm pretty sure this, this democracy summit meeting that the Americans are trying to organise, I'm pretty sure that many of them will be quietly, deeply attracted to the Chinese-Russian position. And the Americans have had a recent lesson in this, and one which I'm going to discuss shortly in a different video. And that is Secretary Tony Blinken's uh, trip, recent tour of Africa. Because what Blinken found as he toured African country after African country is that the Russians were prepared, that the, the African countries were all prepared to listen to all the things that he had to say. They treated him very politely. They were happy to, to take America's money and accept America's help. But they also made it equally clear to Blinken that they're not prepared to take sides and certainly not take sides against China. On the contrary, all of them want to see a strengthening of their relations with China. In other words, they refuse to be dragooned by the United States into this alliance of democracies against China. Just as the United States has found it all but impossible to rally the Asian states, so it is finding it extremely difficult to rally the African states in this great superpower global conflict between the, between the West and the Eurasian powers led by the Russians and the Chinese. So it's, a, as I said, a message which I think many Western, many, many non-aligned countries are going to be attracted to. Dare I say it, it is more attractive to many of them than the offer that the old Soviet Union used to make. After all, the Soviet Union did support many countries of what was then called the, globe, the Third World. Today we call it the Global South. It was prepared to support them in their anti-colonial and anti-imperialist wars as they fought against the um, old colonial empires of Europe. But at the same time as it did that, the Soviet Union could not provide the kind of economic support that the Western powers could, and Russian Soviet support came with a very heavy degree of ideological baggage. The Soviets had, of course, a deeply ideological foreign policy and a very um, doctrinaire political system and a very doctrinaire ideas on how economies should be managed. And very much like the United States today, they did expect that countries that align themselves with them should at least copy, to, even if only to some extent, their way of doing things. By contrast, the Chinese and the Russians today seem to me to be offering a much better deal. Firstly, economically, they're far more competitive than the Soviets ever were. The Americans can offer economic support, so can the Chinese and the Russians, to essentially the same degree. You want to build a dam, you want to have trading relations, you want railways, you want any kind of development, you want to sell your goods to, into our market. Well, the Chinese and the Russians can offer that, just as the United States can. The Soviet Union couldn't, at least not at anything like the same degree, the Russians and the Chinese can. And moreover, they don't come 
with that heavy ideological baggage that the Soviets did. They don't come along and say, look, if you want to align with us, well, you've got to, be, you've got to adopt some of our ideas. You have to remodel your economy. You have to at least give token obeisance to us on, not just on foreignish policies, but on domestic policies as well. What did the Russians and the Chinese say this time? No, we're absolutely happy to be your friends. We're happy to provide you with development assistance. And what you do with it, well, that's your business. You can run your affairs as you choose. We have no concern about that. We accept and we believe it's democratic to allow you your right to determine your own affairs by yourself. And as for foreign policy, well, obviously, we'd like you to be our friend. And if you take our money, well, you, we expect you to be our friend. But at the same time, we understand that you have your own voice, your own opinion. We are going to listen to what you say. We're going to treat you with respect. We don't expect you just to, st follow, to step into line and to follow us on whatever we do. So I can see why that is actually a more attractive package a more, uh, than what far more attractive package than what the Soviets used to offer and one which could appeal to a lot more countries and to a lot more people. Anyway. There is one final point I'm going to make about this really interesting statement. And this relates not to China and Russia, but to China specifically. Because to my mind, there is also a particular twist to this particular uh, summit meeting, which makes it particularly uh, controversial in terms of China. And that is obviously the inclusion of Taiwan in this uh, um, in this in this uh, summit meeting, this virtual summit meeting. And I think that the Chinese are concerned that introducing the Taiwan into this question in this sort of way is going to make is intended to make it's easier to prepare the international community for a situation where Taiwan becomes an independent uh, country. In other words, it's gradually trying to create a situation where Taiwan is accepted by most of the world as part of the international community. And I think that this is one particular reason why the Chinese are so strongly objecting to this particular summit meeting. Now, given how important the situation of Taiwan is the, for China, I think that this essentially means that as the United States perhaps looks to create a situation of international recognition for Taiwan, that's going to make the Chinese rely on the Russians even more. And I suspect that you will see that the Chinese-Russian alliance is going to strengthen even further with both the Chinese and the Russians looking at this and saying to themselves that this is a particular challenge that's coming from the United States, which we have to face down. I think this global summit, the democracy summit, is going to prove a key turning point. And by the way, I think it is a serious mistake. It is, on the one hand, giving an ideological dimension to superpower competition, something which perhaps it might have been wiser for the United States to avoid, and it's provoking the Chinese and the Russians 
as I said, into setting up their own, own ideas and providing their old, own alternative vision of world governance whilst taking on the United States intellectually in a way which, until very recently, they were extremely reluctant to do. And, as I said, I think the package that they're offering is an attractive one. But I also think that it is also going to have the effect of cementing that alliance between China and Russia more strongly and even further. Given that the United States increasingly seems to understand that it is in a two-front war situation or a potential two-front war situation with China and Russia, that seems misguided indeed. But it shows the extent to which the United States, in my opinion, perhaps driven by its own ideological fixations, has lost sight of the realities in international relations. Well, thank you for joining me again today. Uh, I hope you will join me again soon in future programmes on this and other topics, both on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforo. I also look forward to you joining me um, on uh, Locals, where we have an active community. Uh, you can find links under this video. This community posts lots of exclusive content. We also post exclusive content um, on our Locals platform. And now I do regular live streams every Wednesday there. So you can join us there on Locals um, and um, you're very welcome to participate and join us there too. And of course, we're also present on multiple other platforms, BitChute, Library, Rumble, Odyssey, SuperU. And you can support us or support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. And you can also come to our shop and buy our amazing magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, our t-shirts, and all the rest. And of course, if you've liked this video, I'd ask you to press the like button and also please check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon and have a wonderful day until then.